Oh, can you, uh, can you stop the boat? How many killed him? That was the most riskiest part of life that I've taken, this journey. These children, these mothers, uh, these innocent people are literally at the hands of the sea and at the hands uh, of death. We were traveling for about five days without any food and water and everybody was approaching to death. When you hear a 13-year-old telling you, man not good, and she's pointing at her body. Some drop down in the desert. Some get shot inside Libya. And others come through to the sea and later on they lost their life. This is like uh, gambling, gambling with people's lives. and then we'll start procedures from there. Thank you very much. I show up my radar and the Oh, bash it, you. Bash it. The search and rescue team is lowering the rib to be able to uh, go and intercept the vessel in distress, which is about four miles away. So probably we're going to get closer with the Phoenix, and then once we're in sight, we're going to deploy the rib. minute we accosted um, uh, the boat, it was clear that, that some water was going in because the bilge pump was pumping in water. How many killed him? Is there anybody very sick? There were a lot of women and a lot of children. We started um, the rescue straight away. Once we started the rescue, wind started picking up. Is there no one moving? Is there no one moving? Hey, 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 move, 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 back, move, back, go back. Had that boat um, been on the way, um, it would have encountered problem. Water would, would, would keep seeking in, particularly in those kind of conditions. That was the most riskiest riskiest part of life that I've taken, this journey. I, I thought being dead, that's why I, I was feeling. We were traveling for more, one hour or two hours, everybody may die. You just give yourself to God, just like that. When they come on board, the first thing the first thing that you see in their eyes is the desperation. Yeah, yeah, sit down, sit down, please, yes, okay. Okay? I think 
it's a bit of a combination of seasickness and um, I mean these people have endured a lot and uh, just to go to another phase and uh, feel relatively safe is, can be extremely emotional. One guy working non-stop putting uh, buckets of water out of the boat. People see that, so they know that the boat is making water. So yes, they are calm, but I would not dare to say they're not scared. Yeah, I speak English. Okay, so there's no smoking on the boat, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome. No I came from Gambia to Senegal, Senegal to Mali. Oh, yeah. You know, from Mali to Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso to Niger. Then I have to cross the desert to come to Libya. The first day I came to Libya, that was one of the worst days I will remember. They took us to the bush inside the mountains. They beat us seriously. They took all our money, our mobile phone, our rings. The worst moment in my life is while I was traveling from Khartoum to Libya. Uh, we were traveling for about five days without food, any food and water and everybody was approaching to them. And even they don't treat us as uh, humans, they are treated as animals. We see unfortunately signs and symptoms of torture. People who have their teeth beaten out of their mouth. We see unhealed scars uh, on different uh, sides of the body. Every woman who is pregnant on the boat often asks me, like, please double check my child because I've been kicked in my stomach three times when I was uh, not fast enough to get into uh, a different room or into the car or into the bus. I had two young women who were <clears throat> sexually abused. When you hear a 13-year-old telling you, men not good, and she's pointing at her body and when you hear these things you just you just want to break down and cry every night the libyans will come and take women from us they go and have sex with them if you cry you he will beat you that is how it works there every person i talk to who is here on the boat knowingly puts their life at risk and they literally tell me it's in the hands of god if I'm supposed to die, I will die. But anything is better than stay in this place where I was before. I think something should be done to stop these illegal uh, trips. It is illegal not because uh, people are going to Europe. Illegal because the way they are uh, sending them to, to do the trip. This is like uh, gambling, gambling with people's life. I'm feeling so good because I am reaching my girl. I am already on the place of my destination, so I am nice. And everybody is also feeling it, not only. This is the story of our partner, Uncle Mutta Guzo, and it's a. I'm like a Tagus Kumirayer. Thousands and thousands and thousands of migrants are doing this journey. Italy is taking all uh, the migrants at the moment, but. If Italy decides uh, not to take any more migrants, what would happen then, my question is? It's not that these people are naive. They know it's going to be difficult, they know it's going to be dangerous, and they know there is a sincere risk of dying. They see no other way, 
no other option to get to some sort of safety or freedom in their life. You do some things in this life that you never wish to do in your whole life. That even your enemy, you'll never wish to see your enemy in certain things, you know. We are so many people in numbers when we are making this journey. But so many, some of them didn't make it even to Olivia. Some drop down in the desert. Some get shot inside Libya. Some get, some, some get apprehended and caught and jailed in Libya. And others come through to the sea and later on they lost their life. Just among, it's just like the lucky ones. This is a story about five friends. Maaz, Majd, Rasha, Kinan, and Khalid, who fled war-torn Syria to embark on a perilous trip to reach Europe. 